Hello and welcome to the Bob Reeves Brass live stream. May the 4th be with you. Happy Star Wars Day wherever you are around the world. Uh, joining me today is the trumpet section from the Star Wars, what do you call that, the trilogy, the last trilogy. Um, so let's bring those guys in. We have John Lewis, Barry Perkins, Dave Washburn, Dan Rosenboob, Rob Scher, and Jim Grinta. Hi guys, how you doing? Can you hear me okay? Hi. Yeah, great. Happy Monday to you. May the 4th be with you. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us. This is so cool to have you all in one place. And uh, I mean, first things first, um, how are you guys all doing? Let's start with um, kind of in the corner. We have Dave, uh, Dave Washburn. Dave, how are you doing? You hanging in there with the COVID and everything that's going on? Yeah, we're doing great over here. Living down in Huntington Beach. Uh, can't go to the beach, but I can get out in my boat and enjoy the water. Awesome. And uh, we got Jim Grinta next. Jim, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. Over in uh, Simi Valley, we got some beaches open in Ventura County. So, uh, you know, we made a little trip to the beach last week and uh, doing just fine. Get some fresh air. John Lewis. John, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Bet. Doing good. Just mowed my lawn. Haven't been to the beach and you know waiting for this thing to be done right <laughs> and barry here. perkins is next barry how's it going staying safe staying safe uh uh not doing a whole lot just just working on the honeydew list and uh <laughs> they're actually putting solar on my roof as we speak so if you hear banging that's what's, that's what's happening <laughs> Well, there we go. It's a, and I, I, we have a kid running over here. Uh, you know, we have school and teaching going on here. Um, who do we have next? We got Rob Shearer. Rob, how's it going? D just down hey, the street. Yeah. Hanging. Speaking of uh, speaking of kids, I have two for sale for anybody out there. Four <laughs> and almost one. They're made. They look beautiful in pictures, but uh, yeah, uh, take them. You can have them. Awesome. No more. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we got Dan Rosenboom. Dan, how, Dan, how you doing? Doing pretty good. Um, just over here uh, in my studio, working on lots of weird projects, and you know, uh, trying to stay sane. You know, as we as we go through all of this. So, awesome. Yeah. And, and let me borrow that microphone when you're done with this. <laughs> that yeah. sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, man, we already have a lot of great viewers uh, from around the world. If you're watching this live, we have the trumpet section from the Star Wars soundtracks. We already have a, a John listening in from Canada. Uh, put your questions in the comments, and we will feature them live here during this Q&A. Uh, to get started, though, I want to ask you guys, uh, I mean, first things first, what was it like playing on a John Williams soundtrack. I mean, I, you guys are all pros in the studio and have done other work. Was there something special uh, about working with John Williams and being a part of that franchise? Well, I'll start. Think, um, yeah. Yeah, there, you know, we, uh, as you know, the first six were done in London. So when we found out that it was going to be the last, or we, I guess we didn't know the last three were going to be done, but we knew that seven was going to be done in Los Angeles. That was amazing, and it was just like the most. There couldn't have been anything more exciting for us at that time. I, my opinion, you know, we were all very excited, and and when we got the call, it wasn't clear that it was Star Wars. What were they calling it, guys? They were calling it Firehouse. Firehouse. The which Firehouse, is bar, <laughs> which is a a bar I think in London where they go to drink, you know, during the sessions and stuff. So, and then when of course we did the trailer, and that was amazing. Um, and you know, I, I can speak for everybody, but I know for me it was absolutely the highlight of i've done about i think 20 somewhere 27 28 pictures with john and you know nothing compares in that time. what do you guys think? <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think we all had chills uh when all this was happening because i i know i grew up on the star wars uh franchise and, and uh just growing up listening to those the main title and and uh the imperial march and, and to be playing that with John Williams was definitely a, a high point of my career, anyways. Yeah, I remember the, the first session. Didn't we just play through the main title just to warm up? Yeah, yeah. He got everybody in there. It's just the excitement was incredible. It was just the the whole booth was just booming with famous people, and um, it was just incredible to be a part of those sessions. It was a dream, you know. After listening to Maurice Murphy. And then get to hear this fabulous section play, and it was like, wow, this is great. Yeah. 
So, so you started with the main theme. Was it like a rehearsal or? Yeah, it was just to to get in the mood. You know, I mean, he he said let's let's, <laughs> let's kind of remember what we're doing. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Now let's be honest. Any of you guys nervous on the first attack? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I know. Yeah. Uh, I started having a uh, kind of a, a regular thing before we do the sessions because. Unlike a lot of pictures where you go in succession five days in a row or whatever, John was like, you know, Monday and then Thursday and then following Wednesday and, and you do at the most two a week. And so we had all these days in between. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if everybody else did this, but I, I would come home night before, a couple of nights before, and I just go in my room and I go, and just keep doing it over and over because, you know, we, we, did those main titles about 18 times. I mean, everything you do, yeah. 10 to 20 times, everything you do, you know, it's, it's pretty brutal. So, so how much of the music did you get in advance and how much of it were you just there sight reading it the first time? They posted everything ahead of time. Uh, that's kind mm -hmm. of the, not necessarily the norm, but it's certainly more normal than it used to be back in the day. It used to always be sight reading, but you know, it's kind of hard to practice pacing, right? You don't know what they're going to yeah. do to you. So we have our first question coming in from John. Uh, how are you guys keeping in shape during this time? What best practice routines should we be using? So, yeah, we're all sitting at home. I... <laughs> <laughs> Who can say they're in shape in this room? I'm not. No. No. No, there's nothing that compares to doing the work, John. There's right. You know, as much as you want to try and stay in shape, and and there's nothing that compares to getting in there and doing it. Yeah, I'm putting in a lot of hours, but again, you, you don't feel like you're in shape ready to go. It's just yeah. it's it's, yeah. Not, it's not the same as as working being there. I think the hours is just different. I mean, those of us who are playing the orchestra, uh, we would practice what what we need to be what we need to be prepared for that week. Uh, so that that takes a lot of your practice time. Now we can sort of concentrate on things that we haven't looked at in thirty years. Yeah, solos yeah, and yeah. that kind of thing. I'd say, oh, could, you know, like oh, beyond just exercises, keeping connected with pieces of music that you like, you know, so that you're not absolutely. just you know, just working the physical part. You know. Can Can I you guys give some examples of some of the things you're doing? Yeah, the, boom the, 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 day, <laughs> the boom method. The other thing. The boom method. Other way. Sorry, I mirrored the boom method. <laughs> Anything else other than the everyone's all doing the boom method? Any etudes? Any solo literature you guys are working on? I found well, it really what? cool book by uh, Timothy Dockshitzer, and it has all different levels of, of warming up and, and practicing, and each section takes about 20, 25 minutes. And I've been giving that to my students, and it's 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 very interesting because it kind of almost gives you the the feeling that you are rehearsing it in in a group. It gives you a warm up. It gives you a lot of stuff in B major, mm. which I hate, but you know it mm. it's it's really good and it keeps your mind fresh. And then uh, just have all my students working on their juries right now, and um, I'm just learning their learning all the jury pieces all over again. So that's my. That's yeah, cool. I'm a I'm a big fan of the the Plogue books, um, the Tony Plogue books one through seven. Uh, I I work through I little bits of every day. I pull a little bit out. Um, I love those. You know, beyond our normal kind of warming up things, I'm trying to change it up every day. Um, but I think, uh, like Barry mentioned, you know, it's 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 not the same. You know, it's uh, for me, and I don't know about you guys, with students uh, who are teaching too. But you know, we're all playing in these like smaller rooms and. You're just not playing like you normally would. So I have to remind myself and remind my students too. The uh, even just this morning in my lessons, like play, play like you're playing at Carnegie Hall, play like you're playing at Disney Hall, play like you're playing, you know, with a full trumpet section because we're not doing that right now. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, especially you know, my students at Cal State Long Beach in the last year, they're both all of them are having trouble. They're getting fatigued so quickly because they're not pushing themselves beyond their small little space, their little room. You know, and so for me too, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I have to keep reminding myself to just, you know, play beyond the room, play out the door, play to the next house across the street, 
those mm -hmm. kind of things. Yeah. I've been using the, uh, um, I've been revisiting the EV method, you know, I don't know, it, written like 1923 or something. And if you're not mm -hmm. familiar with it, check it out. Cause he's good. He was one of the first ones to write a high F in a method book in, in like an mm -hmm. Arvin style method book, mm -hmm. you know, but a lot of, a lot of, and down in the pedal register too, but the Shaban books too, which are, you know, corner on equals 40 ball do, 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 you know and it's brutal it's just brutal to play as accurately can and and i think we're all doing remote recording a bunch of us are you guys already have i just kind of started so get my feet wet i've been trying to record like the Vern reynolds trumpet quintet <clears throat> and some other pieces that i've wanted to record and uh, so that's good to have that because it really puts you you know in the in precision mode as best it can be yeah and my son's a trumpet player. He's 14 years old, so he gets a trumpet lesson every day. Sometimes Ooh. twice a day. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> twice a day. <laughs> we'll play that high C again. <laughs> this is a good time. Uh, this is a good time for accountability, especially for me. The other day, I attended a great uh, seminar given by John Lewis that. Uh, you know, going over the warm ups and the airflow and the airstream and the mouthpiece buzzing and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, at least uh, keeping that going and is, uh, you know, something that, that I think we can all benefit from at this point. And uh, just getting into a little more headspace of, uh, you know, personal uh, issues and things that we're working out and things we want to make better and that kind of stuff. So, uh, that's kind of where I'm at now, and uh, heavily into the Clark uh, Characteristic Studies book uh, at the moment. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just tack on that that you know this is a great time to start improvising if you don't already, and not just necessarily in like a jazz style. Just learning to to connect uh, what you hear in your mind to the instrument, so that you know it, and it translates to playing any kind of music. Like if you're playing classical music, or you're sitting in a section, or whatever. If you can cultivate what you hear in your mind on the horn, then you can match any section, you can play any style, you can adapt yourself to any situation, and, and it's, a, it's a nice opportunity to kind of spend some time doing that. Absolutely. I want to add on to that, Dan, is it's like in what John said, you know, if you, you try and play with yourself, you record a line, and then you add two more lines. You know, can you play in tune with yourself after you just play the line <laughs> yeah and i yeah. find it very interesting and it's it's a lot of fun even if you just do a, a easy four-part harmony harmony uh quartet um i've been playing through the hickman uh trumpet ensemble music and it, it's it's really quite fun yeah yeah so I just want to jump in real quick and welcome all the viewer, viewers from around the world. Uh, let us know in the comments where you're watching from. Show us some love in the comments and ask all of these gentlemen questions. We have the trumpet section from the Star Wars movies celebrating May the 4th and May the 4th be with you. So show us some love in the comments. Ask these gentlemen anything and uh, you can hear your responses live. Uh, the next question comes in about your warm-up routines, and this is, you know, there's probably a thousand warm-up routines for a thousand trumpet players, but can we just kind of go around the circle um, and uh, go through what your warm-up routine is, let's say normally, uh, non-COVID times, uh, like when you're showing up for a session or something. Uh, let's start with uh, Dave Washburn, if you would. Well, I have a warm-up routine I've done since I studied with Rob Roy McGregor back in 19... 84 and i've slowly adapted it to where it's it has a lot of stamp in there uh, it's it's basically doing a breathing exercise to get your lungs ready to go like a jazz style just learning to to connect uh, uh -oh. what you hear somebody's playing facebook to times uh like when you're showing up for a session or something uh let's start with uh dave washburn if you there we go <laughs> I'm t I'm hearing myself. Sorry, Dave. Uh, yeah. You want to get back to what you're Should saying? Start again. <laughs> <laughs> well, once again, um, I studied with Rob Roy McGregor after I did my masters and stuff, and we came up of a with a a routine that involves uh, Jimmy Stamp mostly, but it's a breathing exercises. It's buzzing your lips to get blood flow in your chops before you go to the mouthpiece. There's a little bit of mouthpiece 
and then just, you know, running through different flexibility and tonguing on the trumpet. Um, it's just, I'm one of those that believes that a warm up shouldn't take too long. Um, and then after the warm up, take a little break, and then you get into calisthenic exercises that, that, that um, help you to get through the day. Okay, Jim, what's, what's your warm up like? Well, my warm up, I, I try to make it short, but uh, I try to make it very air uh, intensive so that I'm concentrating just on getting the air moving and getting the vibration of the lips going. Um, so that can be long tones, it can be simple lip slurs, expanding scales. I like to do a lot of uh, with expanding scales and just trying to keep the focus and keep, uh, keep things pretty straight uh, from there. So that my my warm up kind of varies in that way as far as what i play but what i'm going for pretty much stays the same it's just airflow lip vibration um ease uh, uh, um, consistency throughout the registers and uh, that kind of thing so we can include scales and clark studies and all that kind of thing but a pretty short warm up before actually getting down to practicing or playing the gig, whatever it is. All right, great. And John? Um, actually, the, um, the master class that Jim was talking about, Ryan Dark did a week of uh, trumpet classes with, uh, I think he did uh, nine of them. And everybody, the focus was more or less warm ups and routines and stuff. But I do uh, some lip buzzing, some mouthpiece buzzing, and uh, some stamp scales, the six chords, the uh, 3B, do most of that in the car when I'm driving to work and I have it all on MP3s with uh, with drones and everything. I think like somebody's mentioning, you know, it's really easy when we're not working a lot to have your pitch center start climbing out of the roof. And, uh, you know, so having a metronome, having some kind of a drone or something to play with, or even playing with tracks, you know, like we're talking about, mm -hmm. to have, keep that accountability so you don't just don't go hog wild and find yourself what's going on you know? so yeah. but like Jim talks about you know um, you, you know my thing is everything before the horn you know, with the breathing and the support and everything and and just trying to keep the keep enough face time that's that's the biggest challenge for me is to, to you know okay I'm gonna go practice and do that <laughs> all right Barry what's your warm-up like well I guess my warm-up is uh kind of prepare for the day, you know. Uh, I do start with some breathing exercises and uh, some mouthpiece buzzing. Um, sometimes take a melody and play it in every key. Uh, it could be a stamp exercise. Uh, these guys, especially John, has uh, imitated my warm up a couple of times. <laughs> So I gotta think. I gotta think of a different melody. So, so uh, here, oh, here we go. No. <laughs> but it's an ongoing joke in this in this section, yeah. you know. So I I sort of pick this melody I've been playing for years in every key, and uh, of course John's got great ears. So I think the John third time I did it. John plays all of our warm ups back at us all the time. <laughs> That's the joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that melody's working for me, so I just keep doing it. Yeah. yeah so. It is. It's a great uh, melody. Yeah, with just just soft, low playing, I start out doing that, and then and uh, little by little going up by half steps, just to prepare for the day. Great, Rob, what's your warm up like? Uh, I think similar to what everybody said. I I think the one thing I'd add is, um, you know, I I was lucky to get to study with uh, you know a few descendants from the Bill Adam routine, and then a few descendants of the Jimmy Stamp routine. So. John Almeida in uh, Central Florida, we did a lot of, st of uh, Bill Adam. And so, you know, I sort of focus on those those things conceptually. And then uh, out here, I studied with Boyd Hood and Don Green and a few other people. And, um, you know, we, we stayed more like, you know, Jimmy Stamp or Thibault and stuff like that we talked about with Don. And so for me, I get bored really easily. So I change it up. I try to do something a little bit different every single day. Um, so I might start with some, you know, lead pipe buzzing bill, bill adam just try to get a sound out you know i might just do some mouthpiece um i might do some expanding scales like bill adam i might do some of the schlossberg slash stamp stuff so i'm just trying to change it up for me every day right now especially and just uh play really loud play really soft 
and uh, you know just keep this whole thing, keep the train moving forward somehow. Great. And last but not least, Dan, what's your warm up? Yeah, I mean it's pretty similar to what a lot of these guys are doing. I would just throw in that um, that I like to incorporate a lot of uh, bends and breath attacks into the into the warm up to get a sense of just like immediate response and and elastic. Uh, flexibility in the chops um, typically speaking uh, I try to think about the warm-up being fairly quick and then get into actually practicing and, and moving the air um, uh, even even when I'm at work I like to be a little bit into my practicing by the time we're hitting the downbeat so a lot of these guys have seen me do a fairly extensive uh, warm-up thing but it's not really a warm-up it's more just I want to feel a little bit a little bit worked uh, by the time we start um, and that's just that's just a personal preference thing but um, as far as warming up yeah buzzing um, breath attacks bends some descending arpeggios to get the sense of the air moving forward through the horn and a rich resonant sound in the low register and uh, yeah that's pretty much it Dan's a really good uh, really good example of somebody who walks walks the walk and of the talk and everything his book is he, he plays it beautifully and and uh it's hard it's an amazing book <laughs> it's hard and and i hear him warm up with it like wow every yeah. day it's it's quite amazing humbling i think <laughs> it's humbling i <laughs> well it, it, i mean just to throw the caveat out there the book was intended to be uh, a challenge for myself and and it you know it's it started as just what i was practicing to push my own technique and endurance so uh, it's kind of jumping in the deep end, you know, but there's there's ways that you can approach it uh, sort of less intensively. We can talk about that another time. <laughs> All right. Next question <laughs> comes from uh, Michael in Wichita, Kansas. What advice do you hey, have? Michael. For, what advice do you have for a college aged musician interested in becoming a studio player? Anyone want to jump in on that? <laughs> Well, wow! I'll, I'll start. I, I remember when I first moved to Los Angeles, I met one of the first people I met was Yuan Racy, and Yuan used to say, first he said, "Yeah, great. There's always room for another trumpet player." And and I think we'd all agree that there is. There's a smaller pie, um, but um, you, you know, a person we used to work with, he's famous for saying, "You have more chance of being a space shuttle pilot than you do a professional trumpet player," and I don't agree with that. I think that everybody has an opportunity to do things you know but um there are different ways to do it but i think we all did it the same way you, you get your playing to an incredible point you meet other players and if they like you you get referred to other things to cover for them through them you get introduced to the contractors and uh and you know you have to build trust in everybody you work with and then eventually if the leader the the uh, composers or orchestrators want you that's another echelon but the people that go right for the, the composers some of them work or the people that go in different ways and end up starting to take a lot of people's work um you know it doesn't i don't think it ends up well in the long run but be a good pl great player good person and be consistent anybody add to that uh, i heard a, a great encapsulation from uh, uh amazing woodwind studio player dan higgins and one of the things he said was was focus on being a great player and somebody that they'd want to record you know so like if you get your playing to the level where people want to record it then you'll start getting asked to record it you know um uh, rather than trying to think about going specifically for a recording career it's just like improve your general playing to the point that people want to document it yeah and how many of you guys only do record that was soft for me. Was that soft for me? Yeah, yeah, I didn't hear you. Sorry. Keep turning my mic down because I get there feedback. Go. Can you there hear me go. now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, so how many of you guys only do recording? You guys all do live playing and freelancing and out stuff outside of the studios, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. After. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I mean, yeah. in the old days, you used to have staff studio, you know, you had a, the Fox studio, orchestra and the Paramount, things like that. And now it's all freelancing, but... Even then, those guys used to play live and do other stuff, the bowl and things like that. So things were yeah, a lot different not... back then in a lot of ways too. There were quotas; you couldn't play more than a certain amount of 
jobs per week, you know, and the studio orchestras weren't that long. It wasn't that many years. I don't know why we're getting a ghost in the in the sound, but um, yeah, I hear it. You know, Echo. So we we all play live, and I don't think I don't know about anybody else, but I moved out in '81. It was not my intention to be a, a recording studio trumpet player. It's because this was the place to be, and and uh, you know, so I don't know about anybody else because we I, I hear more and more. I want to be a studio player. I want to be with. So what do you want to do? I want to do what you do. I said, well, get in line. Everybody wants to do what we do. You know? <laughs> yeah, I think focusing on being a great, you know, musician, orchestral musician, jazz musician, commercial, you know, you have to be really well-rounded to work out here. You, you're playing all different styles. I think we've all done, you know, salsa bands and, and all kinds of various uh, other, you know, things, big bands. And, you know, uh, just be as diversified with your portfolio as you can be. Uh, in the music world, be listening to a lot of different um, styles of music. And um, again, I had a, a great teacher who said, you know, you want to be able to say yes when the phone rings. Um, you want to be like, yes, I can do that and not be like, oh, I hope I can do that today. You know, so it's tough. You got to keep a lot of plates spinning. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. I think uh, everybody here feels very, very, very lucky to be doing what we're doing. Um, you know, every day is a new day. You never know if you're going to get to work the next day. That's the scary part. Um, but, uh, you know, but then again, we got to be a part of the uh, Star Wars family here. So. Yeah. And I think a lot of us, a lot of us, for all of us, our piece, our income together with different income streams. Yeah. You know, Dave's principal in the Chamber Orchestra and John's principal in Santa Barbara. Uh, you know, uh, I'm principal in Pacific Symphony and Rob is uh, principal in Hollywood Bowl Orchestra. So we need all these streams of income to sort of make this work. I don't think any of us are solely uh, uh, just doing the movie recording. Yeah, we're all teaching. Uh, so hopefully, and hopefully our orchestra jobs will come back. But for now, yeah. we're just waiting around. Yeah. yeah. I think one thing that was hardest for me when I first started in the studios is that we never really practice with headsets on. I think now it might be a little bit different, but getting used to playing with a click, you know, having to come from a, a different source than just being in the room, but actually wearing a headset and, and hearing a click and then being able to hear other people. And um, the biggest thing for us when I started was just being a very good sight reader, being able to read anything that they put in front of you very quickly. Yeah. So if you yeah. do have aspirations for that, your sight reading skills need to be top notch and is what everybody else said, just being able to be in control of your instrument and, and knowing, you know, that you can be confident in it and that it's anything that's thrown in front of you. Yeah. To add to that, that we're usually reading everything down a step because we're most, most 99% of the time I'm on C trumpet. So when they throw, we're reading everything down a step when we, when we're sight reading it. So. And also That's in terms of timeline, you guys were all in town for a while before you started doing studio. Oh, yeah. Correct oh, yeah. me if I'm wrong. Oh, I mean, it's oh, not yeah. like an overnight thing. It's not no. like no. paying your dues. Yeah. Uh, let's sure. move on to the next question. Comes from Carlos. Uh, <laughs> what are your opinions on mouthpiece buzzing? Uh, let's just start with a show of hands. How many of you guys <laughs> buzz your mouthpiece as part of your routine? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's all of you. Okay. Um, pros, cons, how do you uh, integrate it into your plane? I got, I, got, I got a funny story, and you guys can take over, but it happened to me just last night. My son's 14 years old, and uh, he comes up to me. He goes, Dad, I can't play soft, because he has to play something that's pianissimo. I can't play soft. I said, well, let me hear it. And, of course, it's just air and no, no, uh, no focus. And I said, well, you've been playing loud for the last half hour. Of course, you're not going to be able to play soft. Your, your chops are spread. I said, well, do this for me. Just just a buzz a couple notes on your mouthpiece. Just hold it with two fingers and buzz just a few notes for me. And he did that. And then uh, I said, now play the same passage, pianissimo. And it was perfect. So that kind of opened his eyes of the benefits of, of mouthpiece buzzing and, and how it, it works in, in making everything work so efficiently. Yeah, it brings but, uh, everything back together. It's great. Yeah, that was his friend. I mean, he was, he was, Dad, I don't want to waste time buzzing my mouthpiece. I just want to play, you know. That's a 14-year-old's uh, attitude towards playing trumpet. But he found out last night pretty quickly 
that uh, you can't just pick up the horn and blow. You know, I think the biggest yeah. thing for me, mouthpiece-wise, is that you need to know why you're doing it. You just don't do it to do it, but you need to know why you're doing it um, and when, when in the day you're doing it. If you're using it as a warm-up, you know, for me, it's to help get blood in my chops. And what John was saying earlier about pitch, you know, if you use a drone or if you're playing with a piano, you're already getting a pitch sense before you get to the trumpet. So basically, you're in control of your pitch, and when you get to the trumpet, the trumpet is not in control of it. You're you're controlling where you want the pitch to be. Yeah. Yeah. There's a you know singers can if you're going to go if you're a singer and you want you want to go for a note you just you just do it or if we're talking or whatever, and um, if a person is familiar with playing the mouthpiece mm -hmm. and and like Dave said you're you're actually in control of things if you can buzz a high B flat or if you can buzz an in tune A in the staff or whatever, that training, as long as when you're playing, you're actually still in line and you're not, you know, fighting the horn. Um, if kids are having trouble playing passages, you know, ah, da, 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 pha, 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 you know, well, do it on the mouthpiece. They'll hear, pha, 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 pha. they'll hear the response changing or whatever, or that they're not actually playing the pitches. That's another thing that happens. Because you can get away with a lot when you're on the horn. You can be buzzing something and it's not even the right note and it'll, the trumpet will lock it in. But if you're playing, um, I believe anyway, if you're playing the mouthpiece alone and melodically and, and in tune and in time, then and you put that in the instrument and do the same thing, I think the results can be kind of amplified. All right, great advice, everybody. To, Anyone, someone else want to jump in or we move on to yeah, the next I, question? I, I, think it's, I think it's really important what, uh, what Dave said about, you, you have to know why you're doing it. And I think that applies to, to all the warm up and, uh, and mouthpiece buzzing and anything that you're doing. It, it, it can't be mindless, you know, just mindless buzzing and, and like, well, what's this for? And uh, I mean, John brought up the, the point. It's like, you're, you're trying to accomplish a certain thing by doing that. And, and I think that that's important. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, next question comes from Paris, France. And uh, please Ooh. let us know where you're viewing from around the world. It's great to see uh, everyone. So give us some love in the comments section. We're here live with the trumpet section from the Star Wars uh, movie franchise and uh, celebrating May the 4th. Uh, so the next question from... Uh, Clementine in Paris, France. Uh, she's a composer, and she wants to know what's the funniest thing that you've played on the trumpet, and it can't be the <laughs> and it can't be the horse whinny from uh, oh, okay, well uh, from uh, a sleigh ride, okay? Stupid horse whinny. <laughs> hey John, how about the uh, how about it too that we had to do? Oh, that was pretty. I don't think that was funny. That was just kind of. That was funny. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, for uh, for it too that you know John and I had to. Uh, uh, I think was anybody else there? Was it just two? I can't remember. It's just two. Barry, were you there? I I I can't remember. I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. And anyway, so yeah, we had to do this. There's a scene where uh, the clown comes out of the sky towards one of the guys, and he sings this song. Na 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 na. It's something like that. <laughs> Well, we had to we had to play it really poorly, um, you know, sort of like a middle school band would play it, just like really watching out of tune. We must have done it, I don't know, fourteen or fifteen times, and it just got worse and worse and worse to <laughs> play. Uh, but we've had a few things like that, um, uh, you know, uh, where you, I think those are always the funniest for me when yeah. we're trying to imitate, you know. An, an amateur, you know, younger, beginning trumpet player for some picture or scene or something like that. Those come up maybe once or twice a year, and and those, I, it's hard for me to get through them. I laugh. I just I can't oh, yeah. help it. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> when we did the the, the Johnny Depp um, Zorro, uh, there's a scene. No one saw. Where, well, three people <laughs> <laughs> took two of my kids, um, but when there's a scene where they build the railroad and where when they when they came together, you know, they had this this uh, turn of the century band uh, or whatever. Even before that, they had this little brass band with the the, the uh, backfire horns and everything and cornets and everything. And we <laughs> we had some of the world's best brass players there, and and it was like playing so badly i mean i was i was crying i was i was it was so funny you're, you're trying to play laughing and uh it's when you have to play something bad that's usually and you usually have to have to put a qualifier like we want to hear it's like a bad or we want to hear like a high school band well is that a 
a good yeah. high school band or oh, yeah God. yeah <laughs> that's right because, because years ago we did a, a remake of the music man and so you know we go and you get to do that and get paid for it <laughs> and also i just want to say that there were many times during the star wars things that dan and i were just like like i can't i can't believe we get to do this for a living yeah. you know we were yeah. all like that we were just in awe and there I'm, i know it's getting off the topic of of funny stuff but i really want to say that when we um anytime certain composers bring out certain traits in the orchestras and john brings it way yeah. to the top of the spectrum everybody's you know it's like when ef hutton talks people listen you right. know uh, if you can remember that far back, Dan wasn't born, but, um, you know, you listen, he, he didn't use, uh, uh, click our, what am I trying to say? Measure, measure counters. He didn't have that. So you had to pay attention, no phones, no nothing, no, uh, distraction of the movie behind us. So everybody was completely on their game all the time. And we, we've rarely ever seen John get upset. But remember we saw him get upset once we came back from a break and people were still eating at their seats and for some reason that really really bothered him and i've never heard him do this before where he spoke to the orchestra and said you know please we're we have these breaks and when we come back i i can't remember exactly how he said it but he said don't pay, pay attention don't eat in your spot and uh and that that was really interesting you know the the level that John brought to every every single session, and the very last day uh, when they had probably annual income of maybe thirty billion dollars in the room, you know, every executive and Steven Spielberg and and uh, Mark Hamill and and everybody, everybody was there, and so John just put up this thing for us just to play, and it was the entire suite, so all the mm -hmm. all the breaks were off, all the pressure was off. And we all got to sit there and play, what was it, about a 10 minute, 11 minute suite? Yeah. Uh, and John yeah. just kind of turned around smiling, conducting, you know, just, this is where it all started, you know, and, and we played that thing. And I mean, I get goosebumps just thinking about it now that, you know, and it was full of all the themes from all the different movies, you know, so that the whole process was amazing. But that last day, especially, it's like, God, man. So that last, that last day's on YouTube, isn't it? There's a good yeah. bit of it. Yeah. There's a clip. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we can yeah. we can post the link to that after this so folks can see it down in the comments. Yeah, yeah. Rob sent me one today that was I hadn't seen that Rob. It was like a main title taken from the booth. Oh, for and, and that's yeah. not on other videos. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can send that to John and he can post that too. Yeah, yeah sure. We'll, we'll make sure to include that all, all that in. Now, one of the things about John Williams, I mean, everyone knows him for his big themes and the the big battle moments and stuff, but uh he's also known that even like the filler music and the background music is still has so much integrity are there any particular moments for you guys recording that maybe was just behind something but was really musical or stood out to you guys i mean all, all the whole thing, thing. <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> it's like playing beethoven Every right what, choose a moment yeah. Every soloist, the whole time. you know the the woodwinds there were there were horn days where it was like what were there 12 horns all the time it was amazing and and john would just you know bow down to the horns and there were days where he would bow down to the woodwinds and bow down to the trumpets and just you know he he was never withholding praise you know and it was i mean it was remarkable there's a reason we had some things where there were things got a little pitchy or whatever and still very patient with it and um, Jimmy Stamp, as a teacher, used to be kind of like John Williams is as a conductor in that if something wasn't going right, Jimmy would be happy to spend an hour lesson with this one note that you're moving to early on. And John would go over and over these, these passages that this one cue that the, there were issues with pitch and over and over and isolate the parts and play it again and over and over. And the orchestra's just like... But, you know, we got through it. It was, it was an amazing process. Now, when you guys recorded the soundtrack, it was full orchestra? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
And that's not typically how it is nowadays, is it? For certain guys, yes. Other guys, no. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about that, um, especially those that aren't familiar with studios, like how putting the brass or multi-tracking, things like that? or And if you guys have a preference, being in the room with the whole orchestra or just in the Well, the short, the short question could be, how many guys like recording in Stripes? There you go. There. Yeah, the issue is, you know, so when, when, when you know, the, you know, everywhere else besides wherever they record London or LA or wherever they're recording a, a motion picture, when you go to do it live, as a lot of these motion pictures live, you get to play your solos, you know, with a full orchestra and it feels great. Um, you know, it's, there's a nice, you know, bed of low brass underneath you or, or the strings sound lovely and you're playing this beautiful thing or, or you're playing really loud, whatever. But often, I mean, you know, I've seen John do it a hundred times now, you know, we're listening the brass will go separate. So striping means that the strings will record and then the brass will record. Sometimes we're all in the same room at the same time. Sometimes we don't see the strings all week. We come in at night and we never even see them. So we don't even know what it sounds like in the room. And so just imagine, you know, you got to put on this little headphone on your ear and you got to hear a full orchestra and record a solo from this tiny little speaker that's, you know, you're not hearing full bass and, you know, it's very trebly and it's very, it's hard to hear pitch. and. If there's any percussion in there, stems, you know, cymbals, stuff, it's covering up any kind of string fish that's happening. I mean, there's a lot of issues with it. Um, and, you know, so oftentimes, like I, like I said, I've heard John and Dave and Barry, everybody, you know, we've had moments where we have to sit there and we have to record these unbelievable solos while having a pitch reference to this tiny little speaker in our ear. You know, I think that's the worst part, at least for me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's well, trying to, you don't know how loud do I play. Do I, can I play with this big, beautiful, warm sound or do I have to play with this covered sound? You know, what, where do I play? What, what kind of sound am I great? You just, you don't really know, unfortunately. Yeah, we actually, I think, are all of us using these now? Dave, you're, you're not using the conductive, right? I, I, mine broke, so okay. I went <laughs> back to the Sony <laughs> over the ears started using these conductive yeah. bone conduction headphones because they're really great with the click and when you're playing with whether one ear or two or we generally use one and brass players usually keep the, the speaker most of the way off their head so you can still hear pitch coming in you know um, but with these you don't have to have them you don't have to have your ears covered and you can it's almost like you're pounding the you know uh, the click into your head but when what Rob's talking about, if you're playing, isolating a solo and you, the more signal you get in these, it just makes the hair in your ears just go and it just tickles. It's horrible. Yeah. And, or if they leave yeah. the podium mic on when we're playing and you're getting all the orchestra in, in these little things, it's devastating. So um, striping is not fun. And the other thing that's difficult with the digital age with uh, Pro Tools and everything is like the, the strings and woodwinds will go from 10 to 5. And then we'll come in at seven and we'll do in three hours what they did in six and what they got paid for six and we get paid for three. And with Pro Tools, it's like, okay, go bar 14. Okay, now go 28. You know, you just, you go boom, 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 boom. You don't even have rest. You don't wait while the woodwinds are playing. We just get bashed generally, depending, you know, like John Powell and, um, you know, the guys who write the really great, hard, high, John Powell doesn't want small horns. I mean, we don't generally play small horns anymore anyway, but um, when you get five guys up on high Gs in a striping session, that stuff gets really crazy hard. But we're not big fans. It's a school that everybody wants to, many people want to do, but James Newton generally doesn't do it. John doesn't do it. Randy Newman doesn't do it. Um, anybody else not use striping guys? Um, sometimes various other people sometimes don't, but, yeah. uh, but I, I mean, you got to understand, I mean, at the end of the day for production they, to have that ability to turn brass up and down over the dialogue and stuff. I mean, it's, it's better for production, but for us, it's just really, it's difficult. Uh, real quick. Uh, what if we were talking about the, the bone style, um, headphones, what, what's, is there a particular brand you recommend for those who use them? Yeah. I think, I think we're all using aftershocks. These are Bluetooth. You can't use those cause there's latency. But um, I have a pair here. They're Trek. Trek. Um, there you go, John. These, I what we're, these are what we're kind of using. They're um, they're called Trek Aftershocks, and uh, they have their own little built-in battery on them. They're about what are they? Forty, fifty bucks on. Uh, yeah. 
And you know, bike riding stuff like they're really good for bike riding too because you don't you don't lose, you know, you're not drowning out the sound of the street, but you can still hear the stuff. Um, they take a little getting used to, right, guys? Yeah, but it's nice not to have your ear covered up. Your ears, yeah, still, you can hear the whole yeah. room still when we're playing with everybody. You know, so. Yeah, and it's funny because you know I came with it's like well, many people are using. It. I think it's actually expanding to the woodwinds too. They're great. They're just real helpful. Yeah. All right, well, we have time for just one or two more questions. Thank you guys all who are viewing us from around the world. I have Spain, uh, we have France, I saw Japan in there, uh, guys in the valley here in LA, that's still exciting uh, since we can't go outside of our houses. <laughs> you know, every, everywhere is a foreign land uh, during these yeah. times. Uh, but we have the trumpet section from the Star Wars movies celebrating May the 4th. Uh, may the fourth be with you. Uh, we're kind of a technical question, and this is from my buddy uh, Joe Leva, great trumpet player. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, what do you guys do when you're overdubbing uh, in terms of your equipment? Do you switch your mouthpieces or horns to sound like other players? Uh, well, you have to change it to some extent so you don't get phasing, you know, because if you're the same person playing, you're going to have the phasing problems. But that's Robbie, super rare, though, to be doing that. You know, we don't often, I mean, every once in a while you get asked to record something at home and you have to record all three trumpet parts, but at, at least for me, it's it's very rare. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you change equipment. I guess what I try to do is not to, uh, not to try to be too perfect. It's actually nice to have a little bit of discrepancy and like you, every, if you're, everybody's playing exactly in time with, and it's you, all three trumpet parts, and it's your articulation, it starts to sound synthy again. It doesn't sound real. So it's better to have a little bit of, you know, widen the beat a little bit. And, and at least for me, I think it's, I, it seems to be better, but. Sure. Yeah. All right. Denmark, yeah. Denmark checking in and Germany. Awesome. That's getting late over there. Um, Chad Willis <laughs> asks, um, for young players wishing to work in the recording industry, uh, how can they prepare to work with click tracks and pre-recorded tracks uh, heard through headphones? Is there any techniques you guys recommend? Uh, just do it you know I mean yeah uh, <laughs> it, you could start by just like putting your metronome in your headphones or if you're using a phone you know just like where where uh, headphones are like one ear sometimes like before we started using the aftershocks we would play like one ear sort of open you know so you could just half hear the room and ha and hear the click on the other ear um, or uh, you know find play along tracks like smart music or you know all sorts of other options and and or like grab a um a track that that you like off youtube or something and see if you can like put a click to it and then practice playing along with it but um, there's really no technique to get used to it you just start doing it and you adapt you know for younger players um you know like when i teach sometimes you know, if you even if you just put a metronome and you take a pen and you try to match the a lot of times it'll be they can't necessarily it's not a way of thinking that everybody does and so I, I don't think it's I don't think anybody could just walk in and record even great players you know you have to understand what what the play is you know when you're in an orchestra you're you're three feet behind the violas and and you're whatever 18 feet away from the podium but when we're spread out a lot farther and um the rooms are beautiful like sony and fox are incredible rooms to play in um but you have to allow for certain things you know you're you're we have a mic in front of us but we're actually playing towards what they call the tree over the podium so you have to make sure that you're really on top of you can't just not go with the click you don't want to push it unless you have to if it's not speaking a lot of times they because we think we're really right on it. And then they say it's still behind. So we have to go, we have to push like a 16th. And so it's a skill set that, like Dan said, you just do it, you play along with recordings and, or put on a, put on a metronome when you're playing bop, 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 and be accountable. Yeah. What, one thing that was really jarring the first time I, or you know, the first year or so that I was doing this was, was the delay that you hear in the room so um for instance we're often across the room from this uh french horn section and so sometimes they'll sound 
even later than they usually do. <laughs> <laughs> and and sometimes it can almost be like a half second delay or something, you know, and, and so you have to kind of be able to ignore what you're hearing uh, and just go with the click at the same time as he, as listening for pitch and right. and uh, interpretation. So it's a, it's a split brain kind of feeling sometimes, you know. Yeah, there's no no really way to prepare for that either. There's not. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there's 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 going to be moments of adjustments once you get in there, no matter how great of a player you are. Uh, you know, my main adjustment because I for years I've just played for conductors, I played live, and I was so used to following a conductor, and uh, you just can't do that in there. Uh, you know, it's a reference, but you really have to be with the click, and that was that was there was a learning curve there. I found that working at even at a garage band, you can record yourself uh, with the, they have a click in there now, and that you can listen to it back and see how well you are playing with a click. And then since this is Star Wars, for me, being on fourth trumpet and having to play a lot of lines with the French horns, what Dan was talking about, I was always asking Barry, am I, am I okay? Am I okay? Am I, am I with them? And it was just like, yeah. it was just, at the beginning, it was guesswork, and then you you hopefully figure it out quickly. All yeah. right, let's move on to you, the last question here. Um, John, you got to turn up a little bit. Oh, yep, thank you. Um, I need my own production team here. Um, so let's, let's move on to the last question, and then we can wrap up. Um, and thank you to all the viewers around the world. Uh, I saw Australia. Simon from Australia, great trumpet player down there, a good friend of ours, uh, chiming in. Uh, but this is a great question. It comes from Pedro. Uh, about how to develop the necessary confidence and state of mind to record. Um, so, you know, nerves and the confidence, things like that. Uh, how did you guys develop your own uh, kind of dealing with stage fright and that sort of thing? You know, I think uh, dealing with any kind of nerves or stage fright or anxiety is all about preparation. You just have to be prepared. I mean, you you, you can't sit there and practice two days out of seven and expect to go in there and be at the, at, at, at the, do the best that you can. So, but if you're prepared and if you've practiced and you've, you've, you've done all your mental preparation and, and your sight reading is, is up to par, then, then, uh, uh, you know, the nerve factors is lower. I think I a... with nerves for me is that if you're in control of your breathing, um, all your preparation is going to be able to, to, to come out at a better level and then you just get confidence that way. But the first thing that I found out when I got nervous is that my first breath was hardly a breath at all. And so I learned to, to do breathing exercises to, to calm myself down and just make sure that um, I was in control of my breathing. You know, back in the day, um, especially with fiddle players, they were leaving you know, Cleveland orchestra, they're leaving major orchestras all over the world to come to Los Angeles to record. So I don't think that, I think by the time people get in to do, they get the opportunity to play, like we talked about what it takes to get into recording. It's a lot of other venues, a lot of other experiences that put you to such a high level that I, I think people are probably a lot less likely to be nervous when you're recording, except maybe when you're, when you have a solo thing like that, that's always, you know, scary, but uh, as far as being in a section, if the more competent you are and the more you've earned your own trust, you, your nerves aren't going to be so much of an issue. It's usually it's when the spotlight comes on or when it's like two minutes before the end, and you have to play this, this really yeah. delicate solo. It's like, oh, please don't let me screw this up. <laughs> but yeah. that's the gig. That's the gig. And so, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of questions. I, there are a lot of questions that we're certainly not answering. And hopefully, John, you can just when you wrap up just tell people to, to contact us if they have these questions sure. and, yeah and yeah we can get them just i think you know back. just to just to just in general playing with these guys with this these trumpet players here i mean it's more fun than anything else because mm -hmm. i we're all pretty confident everybody's coming with their a game and uh you know hearing john on principle is trumpet just 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 you know gives everybody else in this section confidence yeah. so right. thanks man one thing I just piggyback on what John said is actually something you said uh, um, about earning your own trust. And uh, when I first got in there, like I knew I could play the trumpet really well and I could do a lot of things, but I realized that I would get nervous for simple things. And I realized like 
I didn't quite trust my own technique to the level that I needed to. So it was a real motivator to double down on fundamentals and really, you know, make sure that every time I'm coming in the room, I'm, I've got my fundamental game, you know, on point. And the level of focus has to la has to endure. Like if you're playing in a symphony, you're done in two hours. If you have even a rehearsal or anything like that, it's two and a half hours. We're there for six, seven, eight hours um, a day and then maybe evening things. And you have to be the same focus from the first minute to the last minute. You can't you can't lose it. Well, I'd be ready for anything too, right? That's the last, <laughs> you know, even you know, sometimes we get, like John said, we get to see the music early. Um, sometimes we don't, but even when we do get to see it early, because oftentimes you see the orchestrator come around with a pile of music, you go, uh oh, what's coming? <laughs> what's coming? And it's, you know, nine times out of 10, it's this four page brutal thing, you know, and you've been sitting, you haven't played for two and a half hours while they've been doing, you know, woodwind solos or horn solos or just beautiful string stuff. And you've just been sitting there, you know, waiting and then you go, okay, here we go. Click, 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 click. Good luck. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah. sometimes we have our horns put away, right, Rob? No, yeah. <laughs> May or may not have happened gotta, a few times, yeah. We're going to go back to that first cue we did. Oh, no. Well, you, could go, you could go to lunch early like you and Wayne do, you know. Like <laughs> another story. That's another yeah, story. Where are those guys? <laughs> uh, thank you to Dave for that. He saved our butts on that. That's one. right. Yeah. Uh, real quick before we wrap up here, did you guys all use sea trumpets for the, the Star Wars sessions? Yeah, I use B flat on the main title, but C for everything else. Yeah, yeah. C's. C's. Did C's everyone trumpet. use B flats on the uh, the main title, or is just you? No, I I did too. I don't know. Different times, different people use their. Uh, one of the movies I use C. I think the last didn't maybe for the end credits. I don't I don't know. I, I when, always use C. When I was there, I was usually subbing in for somebody, and and oftentimes for Dave, um, he'd be out soloing. Was you know some chamber orchestra somewhere playing some beautiful piccolo stuff. But um, I would often be on the fourth chair um, with him. And I would play B flat sometimes just if I was with the horns or if it laid better um, down low, a little meatier, I don't know. But most of the time C. The the fourth jump is always the solo chair for John Williams and Dave killed it. He was, yeah. he was just nailing it and, and, you know, and in some of the movies, you know, like when we did Indiana Jones uh, and the Crystal Skull, Marissa Benedict was playing down there. and. And Steven Spielberg's like this with a video camera right next to her face. You know, he's notorious for doing that. But it's, uh, it's, you know, my first six notes with John Williams were with Hook, um, you know, and they were solo notes. And then far and away, all the solos, ba -da -da, ba -da -da, ba -da -da, all those things, you know. It's a great spot to be, you know, but it's a terrifying spot to be too. So yeah. kudos to Dave for doing everybody. You, these guys, I have to tell you, you know, never had to worry about anybody but yourself. And I knew that uh, if I could play to the best of my ability, everybody's right there beside you. You know, it's like it's like the Blue Angels for crying out loud. You know, <laughs> you, you tip and you do everything together, and, and it was it was a brilliant experience. And I I, I personally am going to really miss those sessions because you know they spanned over what six months, guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for each and, movie. Uh, yeah, each yeah, movie was yeah. a long period of time. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. We have Dave Washburn, Jim Grinta, John Lewis, Barry Perkins, Rob Shear, and Dan Rosenboom, the trumpet section uh, from the Star Wars. Thank you guys so much. May the fourth be with you. Uh, we still have <laughs> <Nice> questions. <laughs> uh, Thanks actually, for having my, us, John. my son yeah, was excited. Here. He brought me in uh, in my uh, <laughs> lightsaber. There you go. I didn't have to use it. The, the, who would have thought? So many trumpet players in one room. And I, uh, thank you guys so much. Great information. And uh, more questions are coming in in the comments. So if you guys are bored and want to pop in the comments section on this post and uh, maybe chime in for some of the other questions we missed, uh, that would be great. And also, for those of you watching that didn't catch the whole thing, uh, this will be posted on our Facebook uh, forever. So you can start from the uh, beginning and uh, watch the whole thing. So much great information. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. I hope you're all safe and uh, practicing and getting back to it hopefully soon. So thank you guys for joining hopefully. us. Thank you, John, for having us, John. Bye, guys.